So before we jump in, let me explain a couple things to the Yankees and the young people. I say Yankees affectionately. Uh, first thing I need to explain to you is what we all knew as blue laws. Now, I don't know if you ever had those in the North, but in the South. And this episode probably personified the South as much as any of the episodes that, that you'll see. But, uh, and when I was a boy, we had a thing called blue laws. And blue laws was there was only certain businesses allowed to be open on Sunday. And they were few and far between. Grocery stores weren't open. Uh, the Belks and the malls were not allowed to be open. Uh, restaurants, as I recall, uh, some of them were allowed to be open. And some gas stations were allowed to be open to sell gas. But beyond all that, everything was closed. And when I say everything was closed, everything was closed. Anybody remember? Everything was closed. It just... It didn't happen on Sunday. It was, uh, it was really the observance of the Sabbath. Now, in time, as you northerners move down here, we... <laughs> I'm picking on them tonight. You know, all of those things change because, you, you know, for some reason you move down here because you like it here, but you change everything the way you had it up there. I ain't figured it out yet. No, but everything changed, and, and the South began to change, and the blue laws were done away with and everything suddenly is open. And isn't it interesting how our lives have become so busy? I mean, just absolutely busy. The other thing for the young people that I would point out is this particular episode highlights what many of us used to know as a party line. And, and you're like, what, party line? Yay, party, yeah, no, 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 no. Most of the telephones were connected together. And uh, so if, if you, you would be on a line, you, you know, basically in your business, you know how it is, you got line one, and there'd be one line that everybody would share. So you live on a street, everybody shared the line that went down the street. So if somebody else was on the phone, that meant you couldn't get on the phone. Uh, and and we, we didn't have 10-digit dialing, we had four- and five-digit dialing. And... Uh, so in Mayberry, everybody was on the same phone line, which meant if I was talking to somebody, you couldn't get on the phone to call anybody until I was through, until the line came open. Uh, and so on Sundays, obviously in Mayberry, they decided these two old ladies and their sisters in their 80s, nobody used the phone so they could talk to each other about their feet falling asleep and, 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 and everything else. And I, I, I'm sorry to all of my elders, but that's the typical conversation <laughs> of, <laughs> you, you, you know, you get somebody that once they start having that conversation, you ain't going to get in the middle of it, just leave it alone till it's over. The, uh, that episode probably personified for me what it was to grow up in the South. Um, even, there was even some subtle things I noticed there I'd never noticed before, like sitting on the porch and rocking, and hearing the crickets. Now, did y'all hear the crickets in the background? Um, because what I remember as a boy, especially, we didn't have central air conditioning in our house. Anybody else? We had one window unit in the front part of the house, the, the, the den, if you will. And, but back in the back part where all the bedrooms were, there was no air conditioning. And so you slept at night with the windows up. And you would sleep, and you would hear crickets. Uh, yeah, you'd hear mosquitoes. Um, you had holes. <laughs> Y'all were poor, wasn't you? <laughs> um, I actually, we had a fan uh, in our, I think it was in my room. We had one of those fans that's supposed to pull the air through and out and all that. And, of course, then as kids, you get in there. You know, our big deal was to get in the fan. Blah, 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 and, Now, to some of y'all, that, that won't mean anything. But to a lot of us, it's really special. Life was slower. Life was simpler. Life was more peaceful. 
and life was more content. Um, people were kinder to each other. Amen? Um, and a lot of us miss that. But at the end of the day, it's our fault. Well, what you see, really, when you look at this, you know, this is 1963, 64. So here we are 60 years later. And we have all become Mr. Tucker. Here we are 60 years later, and we are a generation of, 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 of Mr. Tuckers. If you're looking for, for the spiritual applications of this, you, you sort of start with this. Mr. Tucker is a man who lacks the spiritual fruit of patience. He is not a patient man. Would you agree with that? He's not a patient man. Uh, I want this car fixed today, this minute, now. Understand, in 1963-64, that was so foreign for people to see. Today, that's every day. That's every, ask anybody in here who provides a service for somebody else. Ask anybody, ask an electrician. When's the contractor want you to be done? Now. Yeah, right now. Don't you go anywhere else till you finish this. And, of course, they say, I'll pay you when you're done, and then when it's come time to pay, then you've got to go find it. But anyway, th that's where we are today. We've become that. No, patience is gone. It's gone in, at the red light. It's gone at the red light. It's gone at restaurants. It's gone at church. Um, you, you know, James said we're, we're to count everything as joy. Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall in all these trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And it's an interesting thought because all of us want to be more patient. But we don't want to go through the trial that produces patience. We want the Lord to impart patience to us. We want the preacher to lay his hands on me and I have received patience. It don't work that way. It takes trials and difficulties for patience to be born in our lives. James went on and says, Let patience have its work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And the truth is, as children of God, we should be models of patience in an impatient generation. We ought to be those people who aren't demanding. I lost all my amens. I mean, they just all left the room. Count it all joy, brethren. We ought to be the people who are absolutely convinced that God is working all things together in His time for His glory. Uh, I, I'm as guilty as anybody of not being nearly as patient as I should be. Uh, I even have... I've, I've, I prayed about that this summer. It's been one of the things that's been on my mind. I don't want to grow into an impatient older man. Because they're not a lot of fun to be around. They're, they're ne they don't ever smile. Am I telling the truth? You ever notice how old men don't smile? It's true. They just don't smile. They just have this look. And it's, but, but here's where we are. We are in a generation and time that runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, and is always driving and always pushing and always demanding. And if we aren't careful, we will become people who are always driving and always pushing and always demanding 
and we're all headed to the same place. We're all headed to the cemetery. What's your hurry? You know? What's your hurry? I'll talk about this Sunday. I came across it a couple weeks ago. We have, we have accepted the self-imposed burden of omniscience. The self-imposed burden of omniscience, meaning we think we know it all. Now, don't look at anybody. I see somebody. But seriously, we think we know it all. And that's a self-imposed burden. Because here's the problem. If you think you know it all, if you think you know what everybody ought to be doing and how everybody ought to be living, and if you just do this, and if they would just do that, and if you just get out of my way, and if you, when it doesn't go the way you think it ought to go, you become fretful and nervous and anxious and worried because they aren't doing what you think they ought to do. And the truth is, you don't know it all. And I don't know it all. And you have to trust the God who does know it all. If Mr. Tucker was here, we understand he wants to get to Charlotte. Now, if he'd been to Charlotte lately, he might not be in such a hurry to get there. But we understand that he wants to get to Charlotte because he's got a big meeting and he wants to be there. But what he may not understand is that broke down car may have saved his life. Because between Mayberry and Charlotte, he doesn't know what's going to happen. But perhaps God knew what was going to happen. And I try, I, I, I try to remind myself of this when I feel my patience is very thin. I don't know what God's key... God, I may be stuck in this traffic jam. To keep me from something else I don't need to be into. I, it may have taken longer to get my food. Because if I'd gotten my food and left at a certain time, I might have went into something that is not to my benefit. So maybe I should take that burden of self-omniscience off. And say, God, you know all things. You order my steps. Not just the steps I take, but when I take them. And so I will wait patiently upon you. Now, you, you, uh, patience, it takes trials to get there. Here, here, here's another thing when you get into patience that has to be considered, and that's prioritization, priorities. What is it that consumes our time? One of the things is I've been dealing with this with me this summer and my impatience. Do you know what I'm impatient to do? Get home and sit in my chair and watch TV. <laughs> Come on. Don't slow me up. I got to get this done. I got to get this done. I got to get this done. Then I got to do this. Why? So I can get home and sit in my chair and watch TV or whatever it is, you know. It isn't like I'm doing rocket science that night and i got to get it done. Or brain surgery. You know, we're, we're, we've lost the art of being content. We've lost the gift of being content. Now, it, 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 There's two different pictures that you saw on the episode tonight. One man who is absolutely not content. And a whole town who is satisfied. They're satisfied that there ain't no stores open. They're satisfied that the filling station, all you can get on Sunday is gas. They're satisfied to go uptown and get a bottle of pop. What a thrill. Uh, you, you know, the other thing that, that caught me was when she said, we're going to make ice cream now. Those of you from wherever you're from, I ain't gonna, I'm going to get off a particular geographical group. Those of you from wherever you're from, if you ain't had homemade ice cream, you ain't had ice cream. It ain't, it, you, have lived, you better start voting for somebody else. I don't know who you're voting for. But you have been denied. 
Maybe, maybe the week after Mater Sandwich Week, we'll have homemade ice cream week. But you ain't never lived till you have homemade ice cream. And you really ain't never lived till you turn the churn. Now, you get these electric gadgets, and it does it for you. I understand you like those newfangled things. They don't taste as good. You turn the churn and pour the rock salt in the ice and put a couple chunks in your mouth. While you... Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, here's the deal. We didn't have near as much then as we got today. But we were so much more content. For all the advances that science and technology have brought us, they now control us. And they have robbed us of just pure contentment. I, I do remember. Uh, Y'all got me all wound up now. <laughs> I text one of the members today. He said, I have texted you back. I'm in six mile. And I said, just, just leave the phone open. Let me feel it coming through the phone. Um, I do remember sitting outside at night and just looking up at the stars and just listening to the crickets. And, and I remember doing it till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning just because it was soothing. It's really interesting. I, I need to get off this. But what we knew and what brought us contentment, now they have to put it on a little device to put by your bed so people can sleep. <laughs> Am I right? They got these little sleep boxes and you can select the noise, rain or crickets or in the forest. Hey, let me save you some money. Open the window. <laughs> Just open the window. It's all right out there. What, what, and, 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 and the point is this, we've just lost. You know, Paul wrote, we know that verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You got it on your mirror, you got it in your car, I'll stop. But do you know what he said in front of that? He said, here's the deal. I don't speak in regard to need because I've learned whatever state I'm in to be content. He wasn't talking about South Carolina, North Carolina. I've learned whatever state I'm, I'm in to be content. He said, I know how to be abased, and I know how to be abound. I know uh, everywhere in all things, and I've learned to be full and to be hungry and to abound and suffer need. That's where he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But the power of that is I've learned regardless of the circumstances. If I let God work in my heart, I can be content. I don't have to react, you know. Maybe the mechanic doesn't give me the news I want. I don't have to take it out on the mechanic. Maybe the electrician, maybe, maybe the contractor doesn't give me, maybe the doctor doesn't give me the news I want. I don't have to make them feel like it's their fault. Paul said, I've learned in whatever state, and what he's really saying is this, I've learned that God is God in every circumstance. And in that, I, 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 I can be content. Uh, leads us to the last thing, and, and then I'm done. Well, maybe I'm not. But we'll see. Just pure appreciation of life. Now, let me tell all of my younger brothers and sisters something. These sands that are going through the glass, they're going faster than you can ever imagine. You know, and 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 I, I I was guilty of it, and so so I I I I I say this just from being there. We always want to get to the next phase, and so when you're young, when you're when you're when you, when you're young and single, you can't wait to be married, and then the next week. Um, you're young and married, and you can't wait to have a baby. And then you're young and married with a baby, and you can't wait for the baby to grow up. And then you're young and married, and the baby grows up and leaves, and you can't wait for the baby to come back. And we're always looking for the next phase. And, and here's what the problem is. 
we often miss what's right in front of us. We miss what's right in front of us. I know Trace Atkins doesn't sing a lot of gospel songs. He sings some. But he has a song that says, you're going to miss this. And throughout the song, he, he, he chronicles, you know, everybody, his daughter wanting to always move forward, and she's got a little apartment, and all she talks about is getting a house. And all through the song, he sings back to her, you're going to miss this. You're, you're going to miss these days. You're going to wish it didn't go by so fast. And I think one of the things we've let happen is we've let the culture drive us so fast that we don't even see what's right in front of us. When, when, we, when Jan and I went to, to London earlier this summer, we took the Eurostar to Paris. That's the train that goes underneath the English Channel. I don't want to know anything about it. But it, it went 110 miles an hour. And so my, my thoughts when we got on the train was, I'm gonna enjoy, I've never had a train ride before except Disney World and Six Flags. That's my train ride experiences. Right around the Disney World part and the Six Flags park. And so I thought, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to enjoy seeing the French countryside. <laughs> and so when we come out under the English Channel and they say, we are now in France, and I'm like, I'm going to look at the, oh, I saw the French countryside. <laughs> and I realized, okay, I've got to look way out yonder and fix on something because I'm doing 110 miles an hour. I can't just look right here. And, uh, and that, was, it was, that was, but that's kind of the way our life has become. We miss what's right in front of us. We miss. You know what? Tonight's been a great night. You've sat at your table with friends. You've laughed, you've shared some humor, you're hearing some biblical truths, and this is a great night. Don't let the beauty of this moment just be escaped because you're worried about tomorrow or next week. Here, here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 7.29, I'll give you the paraphrase version. God made us, but we have made ourselves complicated. One translation says, God made us simple, but we have made ourselves very complicated. And for all of the tight woundingness among us, God didn't wind us that tight. We wound ourselves that tight. Oh, that's right. We wound ourselves that tight. That was, everything's always about moving. But you know, there's actually a passage in Psalms that says this, Be still and know that I am God. Uh, we Western cultural people think we have to make everything happen. I was, Pastor Mark and I were talking before church and and, and, and wet Western Christians think nobody can do missions unless Western uh, American Christians think we're the only ones who can do missions. And God isn't going to spread the gospel if we don't do it. And it's very interesting because when the Chinese overtook China, when the communists overtook China, and expelled all of the Western missionaries, we just said, well, that's it, China." China, the devil's got China. But there's over 100 million Christians. There's more Christians in China today than there was when we were their missionaries. We make ourselves complicated, putting on ourselves burdens that God never put on us. And we wind ourselves so tight, and this life that God gives you becomes so miserable. One of the rarest things you will have today is this. Silence. It's one of the reasons I get up early in the morning. It's one of the reasons that's my best time with the Lord before anybody else is up. Because silence is such a rare commodity. You know what most people do first thing in the morning? Y'all got me stirred up. 
the, here's the average American's morning wake-up routine. First thing they do when they wake up is they roll over and go, did I miss anything? Did anybody call? Did anybody text? And the next thing they do is they reach for the remote and go, and it's not that they sit down and watch, but it has to be on. And there has to be noise in the house. When's the last time you gave all your devices a Sabbath? Just give all of your devices a Sabbath. No calls, no texts, no computer, no TV. Well, what? What? <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you, I don't think my wife could do it. But, but, but think about it. A day that you gave all your devices a Sabbath. You might be surprised how good you sleep that night with all that stuff not funneling through your head. I got to go. Let's, let's, let's land the plane. What do, you, what, what do you see in here that you do like? Well, I love the way that the people of Mayberry treated this man with consideration and hospitality. Here's a man who's self-centered and self-absorbed and <laughs> looks at them and says, you people are living in another world. And yet here's the people who were willing to do anything they could to help him on his journey. So much so in the episode that when he had the opportunity to leave, he didn't want to leave. What would happen if we related to people in kindness and tenderness and consideration in such a way that maybe when they could leave, they wouldn't want to because you would offer them what they can't get anywhere else the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Lord, help us to be those people. Help us to unwind, disconnect, turn loose of this culture that has wired us so tightly. Help us to be a people who awake every morning and say, you know what, this is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and we'll be glad in it. And we won't let things that steal and rob our joy and infect our minds, we won't let them be a part of this day you've given us because every day is precious and belongs to you. Help us to be a people who are kind and considerate and impacting to those around us so that your name will be glorified. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Mater sandwiches next week. Maybe homemade ice cream later. Till then, stop by Dillard. Just a good second option. Have a great week.